forever. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the 118th Psalm, verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. We read also this morning from the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel, Luke's account of Cloak Sunday. And we read these words. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The road not taken by our cross. Two roads diverged in the upper wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both, and being one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves of a step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how lay in leaves on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sign, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Okay. 
This morning's scripture readings are very familiar to us. If you've spent much time in a church, you have undoubtedly heard the stories of the last week of Jesus' life. And that story begins here on Palm Sunday. But this story is about so much more than what happened some spring day a long time ago near Jerusalem. It's a story about two different roads. The people who traveled them and the choices that all of us must make. In their book, The Last Week, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan paint an interesting picture of two different marches that entered into Jerusalem on the same day that we celebrate as Palm Sunday. They were two distinct processions led by two distinct men representing two distinct and opposing worldviews. We're very familiar with the march that entered from the east. It was the procession that surrounded Jesus. And it certainly had to have been an odd-looking parade to anyone who stumbled upon it. Jesus, sitting on a young foal, preceded by his peasant disciples and followers who were, depending on what you read, waving tree branches or laying cloaks and capes on the ground in order to give a regal air to Jesus' triumphal entry. But the truly regal procession took place on the western end of town, as Pilate and a legion of Roman soldiers marched into Jerusalem. There was no doubt about the source of Pilate's power. It came from the military might of the Roman Empire. Pilate arrived in town, not out of reverence for the Jewish festival of Passover, but in order to make sure that trouble didn't break out during this celebration of Jewish liberation from slavery in Egypt. Two different roads, two different marches, two different purposes and allegiances, two different choices laid out in front of those who might have witnessed both marches that day. And two different choices for us some 2,000 years later. The road that was laden with cloaks and palms spread out for a man on a donkey. The other road was paved with the power and the might of the Roman Empire. One road was traveled by a ragtag bunch of fishermen, tax collectors, and other various sinners. Whereas high priests and political authorities walked with the other. One road brought the people a message of God's forgiveness, which threatened the power of the religious leadership. The other road brought power to the religious leaders in order to threaten and control the people. One road was open to all, even those who were deemed unworthy, unclean, or undesirable. The other road was available only to those who traveled with their own kind. One road was countercultural, dangerous, and definitely the less taken path of compassion, mercy, and love. The other was a well traveled road of ritual, hierarchy, and power. Both of these paths, both of these parades, would eventually lead to Jesus' death on the cross. But one would lead past the cross into new life, while the other would become just another dead end. Two roads diverged in the city of Jerusalem, and the people had to choose which one to take. In order to really understand what's going on here, we need to take a closer look at Jesus' actions and motives in this story from Luke. Pay attention to the ways that Jesus meticulously planned 
and executed the actions that are about to take place. Upon further reflection, it becomes clear that Jesus is carefully organizing a prearranged counter procession into the city. First, he tells his disciples exactly what kind of mount he wants for the procession, which is interesting because there are no other references in his ministry of him ever riding from place to place, only walking. And he tells his disciples exactly where they will find such an animal. What Luke doesn't tell us, but which all the Jews that were present that day would have probably understood, was that Jesus did all of these things to make sure that he was in a position to fulfill the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's very clear that this is the image that Jesus wanted to portray. But not only is Jesus wanting to make the connection between himself and Zechariah's prophecy of the Messiah, but his goals for his time in Jerusalem match up with the further description that completes Zechariah's prophecy in verse 10. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off and shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus is coming to fulfill the prophecy of the Messiah and bring about the realm of God, a kingdom that is full of peace and healing and restoration. And by his careful actions and planning, he wants everyone to know about it. In the same way, Pilate's march says a lot about who and what he is, too. Pilate's procession looked much different than Jesus. As Borg and Crossan describe it, it was a visual panoply of imperial power. Cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, <clears throat> golden eagles mounted on poles, the sounds of the marching feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, and the beating of the drums. The contrasts have started to emerge. Jesus' mission was one of liberation and empowerment through faith in God. Pilate's was one of oppression and collective thinking in worship of the imperial government in Rome. Jesus' message was one of peace and wholeness that promotes loving relationships, even with one's enemies. Pilate's was one of strength and violence designed to force cooperation. Jesus' allegiance is to God. Pilate's allegiance is to Caesar, who demanded he be worshipped as a god. Jesus comes as an example of life in the kingdom of God. Pilate only understands life in this broken and corrupt world. Those that witness these two competing marches that spring day in Jerusalem, would have understood that there was indeed a choice to be made. It was a risky choice to follow along with Jesus. And the same decision that faced those in Jerusalem that day faces us even now. Do we take the easy route and follow those with power, with money, and with might? Or do we cast our lot with Jesus and follow him to the cross later this week? One decision calls on us to do nothing, nothing much at all. Just follow along, keep in line, mind your own business. The other decision, well, certainly is the road less traveled. And it certainly 
will make all the difference. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.